morning, church. How we doing? Uh, whew. Spring is in the air, right? It's, it's been beautiful out, and uh, yeah, getting out of winter, that's nice. Hi. So, hey, welcome to Mount Zion Church. If you are here for your first time, we just want to say welcome. Uh, so glad that you are our guest today. And when you came in, you received a bulletin, hopefully, and there's a little tear-off piece there. We'd love to get to know you, to reach out to you. Just put your contact information there, and then there are offering containers around. Just stick it in there. And there's all sorts of good information. There's also a place to write down prayer requests, and we would love to um, hear your prayer requests. We have a team that prays each week for all of those prayers. And if you're online, welcome. Uh, maybe you're a guest. If you're a guest online, in the right-hand corner, there is a Connect card, and you can fill that out, and we'll reach out to you that way, too. couple announcements for you. So tomorrow night, we are starting our Discipleship 201 class. So we have our 101, which we had about 20 or so folks attend the 101, and that is for um, people that are newer to the church and checking it out. And last week, we had people... Uh, joining as well. They stood up here. And then 201 is the next class. Now this is a little different because it's four consecutive classes. Myself and Rob Layton will be teaching the class. It will be in the education building in the fellowship hall and we'll be covering uh, four topics. So uh, studying the Bible, prayer, uh, tithing, and service. So um, and then next will be 301 and then 401 class. So we have our discipleship classes. And then also, uh, we have a, a really exciting thing for our, our kids and families coming up this Saturday, the Easter extravaganza. Yes. So invite neighbors, invite children. We'll be outside here in the back parking lot. It will be a beautiful day. I'm sure it will. But if it's not a beautiful day, uh, the, the rain date is the following day, Sunday. Um, so the 27th, come out one to three. Hope you can join with us. And this is a great opportunity. Um, I don't know if your neighborhood is at all like my neighborhood, but we have little kids, and this is a great opportunity to invite those families and little kids. Um, so prayerfully consider. Hey, if you're able, would you stand up with me? We're going to pray before we praise and worship. Father God, thank you so much for this new day. Thank you, Lord, for putting breath in our lungs that we're, be, we're able to sit here to come together as um, Mount Zion Church. We thank you for the opportunity. We thank you, Lord, for this new day. We lift up each church service going on all around this nation and nations all around the world, lifting up the name of Jesus, the King of Kings. Lord, you came to this world. You, you gave yourself to us on the cross to pay the price of our sin. We thank you, Lord, that you did not stay in the grave, but you were raised up. You conquered the grave, and we come here celebrating the good news of what Jesus has done. And so, God, we give this time to you, and we thank you, and we praise you, and we love you, and we pray this in your name. Amen. 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 Let's have some fun this morning. I'll raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I'll raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I'll raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I'll raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of a storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Defeated, the king is alive. 
Good morning, everyone. So good to see you all here, and um, we're going to have a little fun this morning as we sing the praises of our God, our praises of our King, and um, as Pastor Craig preaches today on love, I got to hear it yesterday. It is a good one. And um, so he has a, a special message in store for you, and part of that message is when God calls us a little bit to suffer, 
And their worship team was praying backstage that very point that when we go through trials and we go through suffering, it is the testing of our faith to produce perseverance. Amen. And so uh, a couple of the songs we're going to sing this morning as we shout to our God and praise our King is that very thing that He allows us to go through those trials and experience not only temptation, but things that nurture and grow us in our faith and test that faith. So let's sing together a very familiar song. Let's sing together. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn mine to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, And blessed be the name of the Lord, and blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glory. Blessed be your name When the sun's shining down on me When the world is all as it should be Blessed be your name Blessed be your name On the road marked with suffering Though there's pain in the offering Blessed be your name Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away My heart will choose to say Lord, blessed be your name And blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your name Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your glorious name oh. Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your name Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your glorious name You give and take away You give and take away My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name, O oh, Lord, you give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your
making it easy to love you You are good and you are kind You bring joy into my life You make it easy to trust you You have never left my side You've been faithful every time And all I want is you Jesus, all I want is you You are the refuge I run to You are the fire that leads me through the night I'll follow you anywhere There's a million reasons to trust you Nothing to fear for you are by my side I'll follow you anywhere For Jesus you came to my rescue To my place upon that cross you redeemed what I had lost now my whole world revolving around you you're the center of my life you're the treasure you're the prize all I want is you To trust you, nothing to fear for you are by my side. I'll follow you anywhere. I'll follow you anywhere. Ooh, oh, I'll follow you anywhere. Ooh, oh, where All I want is you, Jesus, all I want is you, wherever you lead me, whatever it costs me, all I want is you, Jesus, all I want is you, wherever you lead me, whatever it costs me. Refuge I run to You are the fire that leads me through the night I'll follow you anywhere There's a million reasons to trust you Nothing to fear for you I'm by my side I'll follow you anywhere Lord God, we've come into your house to give thanks this day. Father, you are worthy of all praise and glory and honor. It's so good to sing your praise. So good, Lord, to shout your praise. Father, we come lifting our hearts before you, thanking you. Lord God, you are so, so good to us all. Father, we love you. We love you. You have poured out your love on us, Lord. You gave your son, Jesus. He came. He poured out your love on this world, Lord God. He went to that cross. He gave himself for all of us, Lord God, to rescue us. 
to rescue us, Lord God, and we are so, so grateful. We thank you, Father, and ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us here. Lord, fill our hearts with your Spirit, that we would worship you in spirit this day, in spirit and in truth, Lord God. Let the truth of your word be lifted up here, Lord God. We come to you now, humbly, Lord God, praying, praying, Lord God, that you would draw near to each and every one of us here. We would cast ourselves upon your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Father. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's give thanks to our God, to our Lord. Amen. Amen. If you could have a seat. You were given a communion packet when you came in. If you could get that now. Don't open it up yet. We don't want to open it until we lift, break the bread here and, and lift up the cup. When Jesus gave his disciples that gift of breaking that bread and pouring out that cup. He knew that throughout the ages, we would watch as the bread is broken, as the cup is poured, and we would commune. We would draw near. He would draw near to us in this, this moment. So it was the night before he was hung on that cross that he took the bread. One of his disciples had gone already. Judas had left to betray him into the hand of his enemies. But he took the bread that night with the rest of them. He gave thanks and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat this, do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup and he gave it to them. He said, this is my blood, of the new covenant, a new promise shed for you and for all the world for the forgiveness of sin. Drink this and be glad. He gave himself on that cross for us all. He offered up his life there for each and every one of us. If you have faith in Jesus, take the bread, drink from the cup. If you don't have faith in him, you can put your faith in him now. There's a clear cover over the bread. I know they're a little difficult to open and a tab over the juice, but know that the Lord God, let's just take a few moments and know that the Lord God is here in this place. Lord God, we are so grateful. We come to you humbly, Lord God, trusting in your mercy, in your grace. We come confessing our sin, Lord, looking to you, trusting in you. We come, Lord God, pouring out our hearts for all of your people here and in all the world. Lord God, we come to you praying for our families. We come praying for our congregation here. We are trying, Lord, to be a family together. We come praying for your people in all the world. We pray for our our brothers and our sisters in places of persecution. We come praying for your people, Israel. We come this morning, Lord God, praying for our nation. Lord, we love this nation that you've blessed us with. And we pray, Lord God, We pray that Jesus would be lifted up in this nation. Oh, Father, our hearts are with the people of Atlanta today as they grieve. And Lord, we pray for for peace, for love. We pray, Lord God, that you would so stir that flame of your spirit in our hearts that we would be those who would go forth, Lord God, to our families, to our neighbors, to this nation, to this world, bringing the love of Jesus. Bringing the love of Jesus, Lord God, to a very broken world. We thank you, Father. We love you. 
We pray these things in the name of Jesus. And Father, we would pray together as he taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. What a great God. Amen. 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 Yeah, let's give thanks. He is so wonderful. Amen. Hey, I've been singing a song lately. Some of you all remember the song from a long time ago. Oh, Lord, you're beautiful. Your face is all I seek. And when your eyes are on this child, your grace abounds to me. Watch out. Pastor Craig's going to lead a song. Here we go. Oh, Lord, you're beautiful. Your face is all I see. And when your eyes are on this child, your grace abounds to me. O Lord, you're beautiful. Your face is all I see, and when your eyes are on this child, your grace abounds to me. Lord, we ask that as we go to your word now, you would speak to our hearts, Father, that we could hear you speaking to each and every one of us, that you would look upon us, Lord God. Pour out your grace upon us. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, this is the season of Lent, which is just an old word, which means springtime, in the springtime of every year. Those very first followers of Jesus to this day remembered how it was in the springtime at the Passover that Jesus went to that cross and died. We have been using a prayer guide for this season of Lent, a scripture and a prayer guide. If you haven't gotten one of those, or maybe you got one, but you just never started on it, no time like the present. This goes up to Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day. If you, didn't ever got, if you never got one of those, they're out at the welcome desk and on the literature rack there. It's, a, I think, purple piece of paper there. It just gives you a prayer guide to write down some prayer requests. And maybe every day between now and Easter Sunday, you would be praying for those, prayer, those, those persons and concerns that you list on that, that prayer guide. We've been focusing our mind from Galatians chapter 2, I have been crucified with Christ. Paul the Apostle said those amazing words, I have been crucified with Christ. And we've been thinking about what that means. If you haven't picked up one of those, I would invite you to do so. This coming Friday evening, uh, we're going to prepare our hearts for Holy Week that last week, remembering those events of the last week of Jesus' life, which is then the following week. Uh, we're going to be showing the movie The Passion of the Christ here in the tent. It'll be 7 p.m. this coming Friday night. Uh, this is a very intense movie. This is not a movie for small children. Uh, there will be child care, but it is, uh, as best as historians, Bible scholars can tell, in most ways, not every way, there's a few things in the movie I'd say, I'm not sure it happened that way, but in almost every way that I see on that movie is very accurate historical presentation of Jesus' death on that cross, the events that led to it. It's a wonderful way to prepare our hearts then, looking to, to the cross. Through that Holy Week, we will have a, what's called a Holy Thursday worship time up in the sanctuary at 7 p.m., remembering our Lord's Last Supper. Then on Friday night, that day we call Good Friday, we'll be here in the tent at 7 p.m., uh, remembering his death on the cross, worshiping to him. Friday night, we're going to do a lot, of, a lot of singing, just praising our God who went to that cross for us all. And then uh, Saturday night, our 5 p.m. service, and then on Sunday morning, we have a sunrise service, and it'll be at 6.30 a.m. behind the sanctuary. Uh, bring along a lawn chair if you want to 
Join us uh, 6.30 in the morning. It will not be cold at 6.30 in the morning. I'm, I'm quite sure of that. And then we'll be at 9, 11, and 6 p.m. remembering uh, our Lord's resurrection. So uh, just it's a great time of the year to set our hearts on that cross, on what Jesus did on that cross, and then to look beyond and what it means to know that he is alive. So we have been asking this question for the last number of weeks now. What did happen on that cross beyond what you could see? And we've been looking at a lot of different answers that Scripture gives us about what was going on there. It was the central moment of history. It was the center of Jesus' work, not the completion of his work. If, that was, if what the Bible told me was that was the completion of his work, then I would look around this world and say, I don't think it worked. But it's not the completion of his work. It was the central moment, the decisive battle. The completion of his work comes when that last trumpet of history sounds. And Jesus comes to bring the kingdom of God in all of its fullness. But it was the decisive moment. And we've been looking at what happened there. And here's what we're going to look at this morning. And that is that when Jesus died on that cross, he showed us what real love is. He showed us. Now, we know there's a whole lot of counterfeit love. There's a whole lot of dysfunctional love. There's a, a lot of games that are played in the name of love. There's a, a lot of sh what I call show love, just like making a show of this thing called love. But Jesus showed us what real love is. And any honest historian, whether they have faith in Jesus or not, any honest historian would have to say that that moment in history and the three years leading to it, Jesus' time with those disciples leading up to that moment in history on that cross changed all of history. It was the decisive moment of history. I've been a, a amateur student of history uh, for as long as I can remember. And I, at one point, got particularly interested in the history of culture. In other words, not so much knowing the names of who was the kings and what wars were fought, but how did people live in different cultures in this world all throughout history? And what we can see very clearly is that it was Jesus who taught the world to love. It was Jesus who taught the world what real love is. Now, I know that as soon as a preacher says that he's going to preach about love, it's very easy for our brains to click off. You can go ahead and say amen. Because we've all heard a thousand sermons about love. And I'm hoping that as we look at the scriptures today, that God will speak some things to us about love. Because it's very easy I mean, we use the word love just nonstop. I love chocolate, you know, uh, I love the ravens, whatever. We use this word, I love you, baby, <laughs> nonstop. Jesus shows us what real love, true love is. And I'm hoping that as we go to the word today, God will be speaking to our hearts in some ways that maybe we haven't heard him speak to us uh, in the past. We're going to be talking about not only giving real love one to another, but receiving real love knowing what real love is. I have uh, noticed over this last uh, month or so now, after this whole year of this COVID season, all of a sudden I've noticed that emotional struggles seem to be ratcheting up in a whole lot of people's lives, all of a sudden. And uh, I think maybe kind of a year, and are we looking at another year ahead? I think maybe that's what's going on in, in a lot of people's lives. But something that uh, just kind of breaks my heart, not just in this last month or two, but for a very long time, is how many people come so broken because they thought this person was going to love them. They thought this person was giving them real love. And it wasn't even close. It wasn't even close. So we're going to be looking to what Jesus tells us about giving real love to those all around about us, but also recognizing real love and false love or counterfeit love. So let's begin in the book of 2 Corinthians here. And we're, we're asking this question, how did she, Jesus show us what real love is when he died on that cross? So here, Paul's writing about, about Jesus and how he went to the cross. It says, and he died for all, that those who live, those who find life in him, he purchased us, we looked at last week, he purchased us from death itself. 
He, he paid the price of death for us all, that we don't go forth to death, we go forth to life. We have that life even now. It says he died for all that those who live, you and me who have our faith in Jesus, might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Now, might no longer live for themselves, but for, and we might expect that Paul would have written, but for those all around them. That he, he, he set us free from, from the sin and the selfishness and the, the, the fears and the anger and all the mess of this world so that we wouldn't live for ourselves but live for others. But that's not what he said. He said that, Paul said that we might no longer, that they might no longer live for themselves but for him, but for Jesus. Now, if you read in the book of Acts chapter 17, the apostle Paul was, was talking about the, the false gods that, in the Roman Empire, all their cities had temples to all kinds of gods. And he said, look, the true and living God, the true and living God is not served by human hands. He does not need our help. Look that up in in book of Acts chapter 17. So why would Jesus, why would Jesus, as we looked at last week, purchase us for himself, that we would live for him? for the one who, for our sake, died and was raised. Well, let's go to the book of Titus next, another letter now that that Paul wrote, this time to a particular man, uh, a man named Titus, who was a pastor of a church. Again, he's talking about Jesus. He, He says, who gave himself to redeem us all, to pay the price, to set us free, to set us free, pay the price, to set us free from all lawlessness, to set us free from this rebelliousness which says to God, I don't need your commandments, I don't need you telling me how to live, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. Wait a minute, to purify, didn't he like purify us for the sake of one another? So I wouldn't be bringing all my mess to you, I wouldn't be hurting you with the the junk and the darkness in my heart. Wouldn't he have set me free from lawlessness so that I would be doing right to you and not doing wrong to you? But he says to to redeem us from all lawlessness, to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Whenever you read good works, good works, it means the works of love. Who are zealous for good works, for the works of love. And let's lift this up, that Jesus showed us, when he died on the cross, he showed us that we are incapable, we are not able to truly love one another. We are incapable of real love, of giving and receiving real love without him. And I shouldn't even say without him because that almost means like, okay, I got Jesus in my pocket now, now I can do this without belonging to him. Until I am his possession, until I belong to him, I'm not capable of real love. Now, come on, preacher, that must be, you've got to be exaggerating, preacher. I know plenty of people who truly love, who do not consider themselves to be a possession of Jesus, do not have faith in Jesus. Come on, preacher, you've got to be exaggerating. Well, you know what? We are all pretty good at imitating what we see. We're pretty good at imitating, you know, what we see modeled around us. And when we see love modeled for us, we're pretty good a lot of time at imitating the love that we've seen modeled for us. And maybe my great, great, great grandfather had faith in Jesus and Jesus taught him how to love. And then that was modeled for his his family. And then that was modeled for another generation. And that was modeled for another generation and for another generation. And we are pretty good at imitating what we see. But you know what? All of us end up hitting that brick wall. All of us eventually fall short if what I'm doing is simply imitating what I've seen. If I do not know that I belong to him, this is what we were talking about last week, right? If I don't know that I belong to him, I will not be zealous, as Paul says here, zealous for good works. 
I won't have it in me to love and to love and to love and to love in good times and hard times. No matter what, I won't have it in me because ultimately I will be for myself. If I'm not possessed, owned by him, if I do not acknowledge him as the king of my heart, the Lord of my life, ultimately, finally, I will live for myself. Do you remember the story of Job in the Bible? So one disaster after another befell Job and the devil is up there kind of mocking Job to God. The devil is saying to God, ah, look at your servant Job. You think he's so holy? Think he's so righteous? Let me, let me just throw a little mess at his life and, and see, what, see what happens to him. And, and so the devil does exactly that. And there's one disaster after another, just horrendous disasters. And finally, the devil says to God, you know what? I'll touch his body. Just let me touch his body. Let me give him some pain. You know, Job was holding on pretty good. He was holding on. It was hard times. Some really sad things happened to Job, and he was holding on. And he was still a man of love. He was still a man of goodness. And then the devil touched his body with what we would call today a, a pain disease. And his whole body was covered. It sounds like a description of shingles, except over, not at just some little spot, like over most of his body. And he is intense pain. And he comes this close to cussing out everybody and God himself. We all end up hitting that brick wall. But what Jesus showed us on the cross is that we won't, you won't be able to push through that brick wall, climb over it or get around it to continue to love, to continue to do the right thing until you know that I am the king of your heart. Until you know that you belong to me. I, I preached, some of you all know this. I never know what words are gonna come out of my mouth when I preach, say we know that, Pastor Craig. So I was preaching last weekend about I belong to Jesus. You know, I've thought about that for a long time and those scriptures just like this one. And I went home that day and I wrote on my hand, unfortunately, it's uh, washed off here. And I wrote on my hand in big letters, I belong to Jesus. I've been saying that to myself all week long. And you know what? That's the beginning that's the beginning of knowing how, learning how, being a person who does give real love to those around me. It's also the beginning of knowing how to distinguish between counterfeit love and real love that's being offered to me. If I don't know who I belong to, if I don't know who the king of my heart is, if I don't know that I am loved with an unbelievable love, then I'll be very susceptible to the counterfeit love that might be offered to me. Wow. Look here in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus was asked by one of the religious leaders. They were always trying to trip him up. They were jealous of him all the time. What's the great commandment? And so Jesus answered him. He quotes from the book of Deuteronomy. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. So the religious leader would be shaking his head. Yeah, you got that one right. But look at verse 38. Then Jesus surprised him. This is the great and first commandment. Look at verse 39. The religious leader, the Pharisee, is saying, where's he going with this? And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love your neighbor. A second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So at verse 40 then, he says, on these two commandments depend all the law. He quoted from the book of Numbers. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So remember when Paul wrote to the Romans, he said, every commandment, every commandment is summed up in one commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. And so here Jesus is making it real plain. Until you know how loved you are by God, until you have gratitude and love for that God, you will not be able to love your neighbor, truly love your neighbor. Love your neighbor when times are hard. Love your neighbor when you're totally stressed out. Love your neighbor when you are pressed, being pressed from every direction. But if you know how loved you are by God, if you know you belong to God, if you know that God knit you together in your mother's womb, that God gave his son Jesus on that cross, if you know that your sin, your sin is forgiven, then you can begin, then we can begin to love our neighbor as ourself. So that first thing he showed us on the cross, he, he, he had to die. He had to go to hell to purchase us because we were just lost. 
We were just lost in our own self, selfishness, our own rebelliousness. We were lost. He had to purchase us to bring us back to himself so that we could begin to truly love one another. Let's go now to Paul's letter to the Ephesians and see a second way that he showed us what real love is. So Paul, a lot of times in his letters, the first half of these letters that he wrote to these churches was, here's what we believe, here's what we know and believe about Jesus. And then the second half is, here's how we live. And so we're jumping into the middle of just a long list of things Paul is saying to, to do or to avoid. So he says, and it's all about love. So he says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. We've lost the meaning of that word corrupting. It literally means death. Uh, corruption, the, the old meaning of the word corruption was death. So don't let words come out of your mouth. Don't let talk come, out, talk come out of your mouths that brings death to those who hear. Let the words that come out of your mouth bring life to those who hear. He says, only, only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. He's saying the only words to be coming out of your mouth are to be those words that give grace, that undeserved. We give people what they deserve so often, right? He deserves that. She deserved it. And he's saying, no, your words are to be words that build up giving grace, undeserved love, undeserved kindness to those who hear. At verse 30, he, he goes on. He says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of God who comes to us when we put our faith in Jesus. Don't make the Spirit of God sorrowful in your own heart by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The Spirit of God who has come and says you do belong to him. You are God's child. He is the king of your heart. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit with the words that come out of your mouth, with the way that you're, you're living. Uh, verse 31 then, he says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. All of it. He says, put it all away from you, along with all malice. Malice means just any intent to, to hurt. Do you remember one time Jesus said, if you even say you fool, you're heading to the flames of hell. You know, we think, oh, somebody who murders. Well, yeah, I guess. But no, Jesus said, you just say you fool. He says, you're subject to the flames of hell. Wow. So here, Paul, inspired by God, is saying, put all these things away. Put them all away. Now, look at verse 1 in chapter 5 here. It says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Here's, here's love then, kindness, being tenderhearted. That almost sounds like a slam on somebody. Oh, he's so tenderhearted. When I first came here to Mount Zion 33 years ago, that was a slam people put on me. I, I would hear people say, he's so tenderhearted. He's so mercy motivated. He's so mercy motivated. The Bible tells me. <laughs> there it is, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Now look at verse one in chapter five here. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Therefore, now, you belong to him. He's the king of your heart. You have the Holy Spirit. Now, imitate that love. And at verse two, Paul spells it out for us. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Wow. And so here we see the second thing. First, Jesus shows us what real love is by showing us that we're incapable of it without him. Secondly, he shows us what real love looks like. As we look at Jesus' life, but more so as we look at his death on that cross, we see what real love looks like. And yes, we are good at imitating. And so we imitate, we imitate Jesus' life and death his death on that cross. We imitate the kind of love that took him to that cross, gave himself up for us. There it is. We imitate. We're not very good at imitating for a long time, but if you imitate the one who's the king of your heart, the one who's always with you, the one on whom you can always keep your eyes, if you imitate the one who is, has shown us only true, real love, as they say, you fake it till you make it. You learn best from what you do. 
then we become people as we continue to walk in love, imitate him day by day, looking ultimately to that cross where he gave himself up for us. And that's what real love looks like. Giving up my wants, my wishes, my desires, not for the sake of the wants, wishes, and desires of that other person. That's disaster. That's dysfunctional love. If what I do is I give up my wants, wishes, and desires for the sake of your wants, wishes, and desires, then I'll be on your crazy train. Somebody say amen. I'll be on your roller coaster then. I'll always be trying to do whatever it is that I think will make you happy. No, we give up our wants, our wishes, our desires for the sake of what's best for my family, for my neighbor, even for my enemy. Jesus was hanging on that cross there for the sake of his own mother who was standing at the foot of the cross, for the sake of that woman Mary Magdalene from whom he had delivered from all those demons that had hold of her life, for the sake of the one disciple, John, who had the courage to be there. The rest of them were scared to death. He died, yes, for them, his his family, his friends. He died on that cross for the sake of the crowds that were mocking him, for the religious leaders who so hypocritically handed him over to the Romans. He died on that cross for the sake of the soldiers who had beaten him so horribly, for the sake of Pontius Pilate, the governor who had condemned him to death. He gave himself up. He put their need before his own wants, wishes, and desires. I used to think when I was a a kid uh, I used to think, what, what kind of life is that? He knew he was going to a cross and he went there. What was he, you know, when I got a little bit older and trying to be so smart, I, smart I like, yeah, I thought, what, was he kind of a, you know, a masochist? He just enjoyed the pain or something? He didn't want to go there. Who wants to go to hell? But he went there. He put our need before his wants, his wishes, his desires. Look in the gospel of John here. Jesus was talking to his disciples the night before he went to that cross. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. And so we look at his life, but ultimately at his death to say this is love. You know, sometimes we think about putting one another first, as the scripture says. Or Paul, when he wrote to the Philippians, he said, count others better than yourselves. We're like, wait a minute, that sounds so unhealthy, so dysfunctional. Uh, It is, again, it's it's dysfunctional, it's unhealthy. If I'm living for you to be happy with me, if I'm living for for me to, to, to give you what you desire, but if I am living, giving up myself, and as Jesus said, even dying, living and dying for your sake, for the sake of what you need. That's true. That's real love. And so in 1 John, look what John here wrote now. He wrote a letter. He says, by this we know love. By this we know what love looks like, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. So lay down our lives. Well, yes, there are those radical circumstances where someone needs to actually give up their physical life for the sake of of someone else, for sure. But look what he goes on to say here at verse 17. He says, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? So I can lay down my life. I can put my wants, wishes, and desires aside for the sake of giving to those who are in need, of blessing someone, helping someone who needs help, who needs the help that I'm able to give. You know, my want, my wish, my desire might be for my bank account to get bigger and bigger. And here's Jesus modeling for me to give and to give and to give. And that's what real love is. So we imitate him. We learn from him what it looks like. Not closing our heart against those who are in need, but putting their need before our own desires. And so at verse 18 then, John writes these words, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So uh, we can say all the right words, but Jesus not only said the right words, he went to a cross and he did what they all needed him to do. And so we look at Paul's letter to the Romans here. Jesus modeling modeling true love, real love for us. He's talking about Jesus while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. 
So he put the need of the ungodly, he put the needs of those who had no regard for God, those who hated God, those who despised God, those who were ungodly, he put their needs before his own desires, wants, wishes. At verse 7 then, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. And so at verse 8 then, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So he modeled for us that real love goes to even our enemies. That's what real love is. You know, followers of Jesus, followers of Jesus, win heart after heart after heart after heart as we love our enemies. It's no accident that the place in the world where the church is growing faster than any place else in the world is China. Because the Chinese government is so horribly persecuting the followers of Jesus, but the followers of Jesus learn how to love even our enemies. And when we love our enemies, when we imitate Jesus in loving our enemies, then the light of Jesus shines very, very, very brightly. So from 1949, when the communists crushed the church in in China and massacred Christians like crazy, until now there's estimated 200 to 400 million Christians in China. Wow. We are at our best. The light of Jesus shines most brightly when we love our enemies. That's what real love is. We can't do it without belonging to Jesus. I belong to Jesus. I belong to Jesus. You're hurting me. You're talking trash in my ear. You're doing me wrong, but I belong to Jesus. The king of my heart is Jesus. What you say to me, I will not talk trash back to you because I belong, I belong to Jesus. I am well. I am safe. I am secure. My future is sure and certain. You take my life, great. My eyes will open the next moment and there I will be with Jesus. We know the goodness of our God. We know his goodness by what Jesus did on that cross. And so, so we, we, we belong to him. We give ourselves to him. And then we, mo- we imitate what he has modeled for us. There's one more passage I want to look at now in 1 Peter. And this is a, a last way that we want to look at now, how Jesus showed us what real love is. So Peter says, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you. He, he's writing to, in fact, the bulk of Christians in that first century Roman Empire were slaves. By far the largest percentage of the very first followers of Jesus, once Christianity expanded beyond the nation of Israel, were slaves. It was a slave-driven empire, and they suffered horribly. So Peter is writing particularly at this point, if you go back and read that chapter, he's writing particularly to slaves at this point. He says, to this you have been called, and he means to, to loving, despite your suffering. He, he doesn't say to this slavery you've been called. That's the sin of this world. But to this, to love no matter what, you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Here that word example is again. We, we love no matter how badly we're hurting. At verse 22 then. It says, he committed no sin when they were beating him, when they were mocking him, when they were ridiculing him. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. He didn't try to lie his way out of what was coming toward him. At verse 23 then, when he was reviled, he did not, when they cussed him out, he didn't cuss them out in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. What does the Bible say? He could have called down 10,000 angels to just smash them all and set them free. Didn't do it. When he suffered, he did not threaten but look at this, continued entrusting to him himself to him who judges justly. And here's this last thing, that Jesus shows us how to continue to love even when life hurts. We continue to love by entrusting ourselves to our great God, to the one who judges justly, to the one who knows what's happening, to the one who knows the number of hairs on our head, to the one who is with us, to the one who will never abandon us, the one who will never uh, forget about us. 
We keep trusting him when life hurts. That's when we make our worst mistakes. That's when we're least loving, is when we're stressed out, when the problems of life, the challenges of life are just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. That's the hardest time to love. People make their worst mistakes when they're totally stressed out. And so here, Jesus is showing us, he went to that cross. He was able, able even to pray, Father, forgive them. But they know not what they do as he's dying a horribly painful death, descending into hell because he was trusting his heavenly father in and through it all. He was descending into hell. He would be crying out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me as he's now in the pit of hell? But he was trusting. He was trusting. When he said that, what was that? He was quoting scripture. That's verse one from Psalm 22. Read the rest of Psalm 22 and see the faith in Psalm 22. He's descended into hell, being utterly forsaken by his, our heavenly Father. He did that so we would never be forsaken by him. But read the rest of that psalm, and it's a, a psalm, a song of trust. He trusted our Father. He trusted his heavenly Father, and he was able to keep on loving. He was able to go into hell because that's what we needed him to do. We are able to keep loving. We are able to push the stress away. We're too blessed to be stressed. Someone say amen. Too blessed to be stressed. Yeah, the stresses will always come, but we say, no, I belong to God. I'm trusting him. And we push that stress away because you are blessed by the best. Somebody say amen. Blessed by the best. Too blessed to be stressed. We trust him no matter what. And when we do so, we're able to continue to love and continue to love and continue to love. The words that start coming out of our mouths uh, when we get stressed out, they can be the, the trash words of this world, the angry words of this world, or we can trust God. God's got me. God's got this. It's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. I will do the right thing. I will love no matter what. What a gift we can be to the people around us if we learn from Jesus how to trust him when we're walking through a hell on earth. What a gift we can be when we're having to carry that cross as Jesus said we would, if we're trusting our Father. And therefore, even in times of great pain, in times of great fear, anxiety, whatever, we're trusting God. And so therefore, we're still loving. We're still loving as Jesus loved. If you're here today without faith in Jesus, this might be the moment that God has ordained for you to make that decision, to put your faith in him. He might have got you out of bed this morning and brought you here. He might have brought you here online to this very moment for you to make that decision that you will trust this one who died on the cross for you. Maybe you look at yourself and you say, I haven't been doing a very good job of even loving the people closest to me, much less my neighbor, much less my enemy. And you would say, I need Jesus. I can't do this by myself. I need him. Maybe you find yourself, you know, possessed by someone who was supposed to love you and pretty much owns you right now. And you know you need Jesus. You know all the more you need Jesus to say, I belong to him, not you. Not you. If you know you need Jesus, you can open the door of your heart to him. You could pray that simple prayer. Lord Jesus, forgive my sin. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. You can dive into him. You can dive into him. Hey, we'll, we'll tell you how. I would invite you to come if you're here in this tent right now to come to this, this altar to pray. Give your heart to Jesus. Let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you. We love you. You are so very, very good to us. And so we lift our hearts before you now. And we pray, Lord God, for each and every one of us here. We pray, Lord God, for, for all those worshiping online. We pray, Lord God, that you would give faith to anyone without faith in your son. We pray that you would increase our faith, Lord God. That, Father, you would give us then the strength and the determination to love, to truly love. That you would teach us, you would show us what that love is, Lord God. And help us to trust you, to trust you no matter what. So that even when we're suffering, even when we're hurting, we can say, it is well. It is well with my soul. I will love. 
I will love in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Let's stand. Let's sing to our great God. are a sign of grace in our lives and Father how you brought us through but deep were the wounds and dark was the night the promise of your love you proved now every battle still to come let this be our song. It is well. It is well. With my soul. With my soul. It is well. It is well. With my soul. Come, remain for the night, the joy will paint the morning sky. You're there in the fast, you're there in the feast, your faithfulness will always shine. Now every battle still to come. Let this be our song. It is well. It is well. With my soul. With my soul. It is well. It is well. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful week. Go in the peace of God, our Savior. And if you don't mind, if you can, please take your trash with you. That'd be most amazing. Thank you very much. Have a great week, everyone.